Hey everybody, welcome back to more reading of Escape Galapagos. Don't forget, if you've got questions, you can send them to me on E.L. Prager at Twitter, or you can send them in on Facebook, and I'll try to answer some at the end. So let's get started with a little recap. Remember, Ezzy is stuck on board the ship with hijackers while Luke, her little brother Luke, and her father are out on the island, and she is hiding in a garbage pail while the hijackers are on board. So let's get going. Soon, a steady stream of men carrying equipment went back and forth across the deck. As he ducked lower, the pail wobbled and she held her breath, hoping no one would notice. One of the goons with the gun came toward the garbage can and she thought for sure he'd seen it move. She lifted the garbage bag over her head as best she could. Then she heard a loud spitting sound and it felt a thwack on the bag now sitting over her face as he moaned silently and hoped it was a wad of gum. She heard more people approaching the deck and peered out cautiously. The first person to appear was the captain. With an angry scowl on his face and wearing just a t-shirt and shorts, the man strode to and down the stairs leading to the stern platform. He was followed by a bunch of similarly dressed crew members and several men with guns. After what seemed an interminable amount of time, the deck again fell silent. As his legs and back ached like crazy, she felt soggy with sweat and she had a pounding headache from the stench. Just as she began to climb out, she heard voices. People were coming up the stairs from the stern platform. As he sat still and again peered out through the pail's throwaway hole, it was the returning hikers. She wondered if they knew what was going on. The stringy hair mustache dude came into view. He was wearing the uniform of an officer of the, day of the Darwin voyage. Right this way, folks. We've got cool drinks for you in the lounge. Lunch will be served uh, soon. Among the returning guests were Ezzy's father and Luke. Everyone was smiling and chatting. Ezzy wanted to shout to them right there and then, but given the guns the bad guys had, it didn't seem like a great idea. Then she spotted Aiden, and he was headed toward the garbage can. He took aim with an empty plastic water bottle. Ezzy ducked lower and felt another thwack on her head as Aiden said, swish. Haven't you heard of recycling, she muttered. Soon it got quiet and the deck was again deserted. As quickly as possible, as he popped off the garbage can's cover and climbed out. Oh, thank God. She took a moment to stretch, breathe in some fresh air, and then looked over the railing at the stern. The smaller boat was motoring away. Sneaking back into the crew quarter, as he nearly ran headfirst into Carlos, the crew member she'd met earlier. What are you doing back here, he questioned. I know what's going on, she told him. Then you better pretend like you don't. Why'd they take over the ship? Carlos shook his head and looked over his shoulder as if someone might be watching. Don't know, but they're serious. They've got guns. He grabbed a tub and started filling it with ice from a nearby machine. You better go to your cabin or lunch. Just act normal and whatever you do, don't say anything or cause trouble. Isn't there something we can do? Someone can call a radio or something? Carlos stared hard at her. He seemed scared or angry or maybe both. No, just do what you're told, but go before someone finds you. As he hurried into the lounge, it was empty. Even the man with the bandaged knee was gone. She wondered what they'd done with him. He seemed like a pretty nice guy. She grabbed a glass of water someone had left on the bar, at least she hoped it was water, and poured it over her head to look even more sweaty, as if she'd been out hiking and to hopefully take away some of the garbage stink. As he walked to the stairs, trying to stay calm and appear as normal as possible. On the way down, she almost bumped into someone coming up, Aiden. Hey, snorkel girl, we missed you on the hike, and it didn't even rain snakes. Funny, she replied, trying to skirt around him. What happened to you? Why are you all wet? Uh, so what's with your brother and all the animals? As he stopped abruptly. What do you mean? Did something happen to Luke? No, I don't mean anything bad. It's just like, like animals are drawn to him or something. Almost like he can talk to them. My brother can't talk to animals, but he does love them, all of them. And I think the animals sense that. It's always been that way, she lowered her voice. But look, there's something I need to tell you. As he was about to tell Aiden about the ship being hijacked, when stringy hair, fake officer guy came up the stairs. He stopped at a glass covered painting to look at his reflection and was about to smooth out his mustache when he noticed the two teens. 
Hey, you, lunch is ready. Better get in there. Yeah, okay, as he said, wishing she could tell Aiden what was going on. Instead, she headed down to lunch, but not before looking back at the boy. The mustache man was staring at him. Hey, dude, what's your problem? Aiden said. I got to pee in the toilets over there, he pointed to the men's room. Of course, the man said, though he continued to stare at the teen suspiciously. As he hurried into the dining room, hoping that Luke and her father were not out roaming the ship looking for her, once inside the room, she saw Luke waving from a table. As she made her way across the dining room, as he tried to be as inconspicuous as possible, she was trying so hard not to be noticed that she bumped into a waiter who spilled a drink, and then she nearly tripped over the selfie twins. Sorry as he joined her family at a table. Where were you, her dad asked. We checked her cabin and looked around a little, but no Ez. As his eyes went wide, you didn't ask anyone where I was, did you? She hoped they hadn't said anything to the men that had come aboard. They still didn't know that she'd been there when they arrived, and knew what was going on. No, her father answered with a slightly puzzled look. We didn't say anything to anyone because we knew pretty quick that sooner or later, you'd show up here where the food is. Why are you all wet? You missed it, as Luke said, speaking super fast. We saw a penguin, more boobies, and even a flamingo. It was so close and the most awesome color ever. Has a neck like a, a neck like a snake. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to mention snakes. And then we went to this pond. As he held up her hand to stop him, figuring otherwise he'd go on like that forever. She leaned closer. Dad, while you were, excuse me, said a man at the adjacent table, interrupting her. Aren't you the young lady I met earlier? It was the injured man, and he was sitting at a large table by himself. Why don't you join me, he added, staring intently at Ezzy. Her father turned to him and shrugged. Sure, why not? Come on, let's give this gentleman some company. Ezzy wanted to scream no, but that would definitely draw the attention of the imposter crew. Luke didn't look happy about it either. Her father got up and moved to the other table and gave them the, come on kids, move your butt looks. Her father looked at the man curiously. I don't remember seeing you aboard you do look familiar. Before he could reply, as he jumped in, Dad, we saw him going the other way on the hike yesterday. That doesn't matter. I have something to tell you. As he must be polite, her dad said, oh yes, you were with the injured hiker. I am the injured hiker, the man chuckled. As he squirmed in her chair, wondering why the guy wasn't warning her dad, telling him what was going on. Dad, the ship, her father put up his hand to stop her talking. I'm a surgeon. Would you like me to look at your leg? Surgeon, how impressive. It's definitely not that bad. By the way, as I said, I met your lovely daughter earlier. Some of the crew from my ship brought me over to see the doctor while you were out hiking. I think we were the only two left on board. As he couldn't figure it out, why wasn't the guy telling her father what was going on? She leaned closer to her dad, as quietly as possible, yet still loud enough to be heard. She said, Dad, while you were on the island, these guys with guns came on the ship. Her father looked at her as if she had two heads. What? A little louder, she said, the ship's been invaded, taken over, hijacked. Her dad glanced around, everything seems pretty normal. The injured man was now looking at her father with concern. My daughter has a very vivid imagination. Luke pulled on his father's shirt and whispered something to him. Dr. Schuyler glanced around again. Luke here says some of the waiters are new and seem to be acting a bit odd. As they watched, one waiter dumped an iced tea in Grandma Joan's lap and another seemed to be confused about an order and was having an argument with a passenger. Sir, as he said to the man, you know it's true. Back me up here. Dad, I'm not making this up. What's your name, dear? The man asked. Ezzy, she said, and then turned to her father and repeated, a bunch of big goons with guns came on board while you were on the island. The injured man just stared at her. An officer who'd been overseeing the dining room came by, as he didn't know if he was a real or fake member of the crew. He took note of their empty plates, is there a problem here? No, no, said the injured man, just having a hard time deciding what to eat. Too many options on the buffet. Oh, that happens all the time, the officer says. Given your legs, sir, would you like? If you like, I could get you some food. Thank you, the man replied. After the officer left, as he again turned to her father, I'm not making this up, and it's not a joke. Men from another ship took the place of some of the crew. Keep your voice down, the injured man finally said. He let out a long sigh and waved them all closer. Okay, okay, what your daughter says is true, but we need to play along. If we cause a scene, he said someone will get hurt. See, as he said, what do they want, her father asked nervously. The man shook his head as the officer returned with the plate loaded with food for him. The rest of you had better grab something before all the good stuff's gone. 
as he wasn't hungry, and she didn't think anyone else cared about eating right then. What should we do, she asked her father. I think this gentleman here is right. We, the name's John, by the way, he interjected. We should just play along until we know what this is all about and find a way to alert the authorities. Or like, get the heck off the ship, as he said. Chapter 10, Iguana City. After lunch, the Schuyler family helped their new friend, John, limp into the lounge. On the way, as he help, couldn't help but stare at each of the crew members as they passed, wondering which ones were part of the real crew and which ones part of the hijack team. Are you sure you're okay here? Dr. Schuyler asked John, who was now settled on a couch with his leg raised. You could stay with me in my cabin and my son could share his sister's cabin. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you. But for now, I'm fine here. And besides, I'm expecting to see the ship's doctor soon. I'll just need to continue acting normal so the other passengers don't get wind of what's going on and panic. We'll do our best, Dr. Skyler replied. But if you change your mind on the cabin, let us know. We're in rooms 310 and 312. They said goodbye and headed to their cabins. Ezzy joined Luke and her dad in their room. Luke immediately slumped onto his bed and turned to his father. What do they want, Dad? Now pacing in the narrow space between the beds and the desk, the father shook his head. I don't know, son. Ezzy had been rolling that very same question around in her brain for the last several hours. Her father spun on his heel and continued to pace back and forth, back and forth. It reminded Ezzy of a lion she'd once seen in a cage. Did you overhear anything else as her father asked? Like how many men came aboard? Ezzy shook her head, I'm not sure. But I saw them bring some equipment on board, these big crates and things. I thought they might be the illegal fishermen whose net we saw last night. Maybe they're smuggling drugs or something. But why come on our ship, Luke moaned. Cover until they get somewhere to offload the drugs, she suggested. Her dad nodded. Could be, I guess. I wish mom was here, Luke said. Yes, son, his father added. Me too. But we've got each other. And she would want us to be brave, just like her, Luke nodded. What should we do, as he asked? I think we should do just what John suggested and pretend that we don't know anything. And Ezzy, that means you need to come on the hike this afternoon. Don't worry, Dad. I was planning on it. I'll take creepy animals over dangerous thugs with guns any day. They looked at the daily program, and Dr. Schuyler read the afternoon hike description. Fernandina is the youngest and westernmost of all the islands. It is also one of the most volcanically active islands in the region. The last eruption occurred in June 2018. In, in 1968, the floor of the caldera sank an amazing 990 feet within a two-week period. And in the early 1970s, the coastline was uplifted some nine feet during an earthquake. Today's hike is about a mile and a half long over sand and hardened lava flows. It can be very hot, and there may be uneven or slippery spots when walking. As he turned to her brother, I talked to the captain early, and he said they get earthquakes here. And sometimes the earthquakes happen when the volcanoes are about to erupt. I think we have other things to worry about right now, her father noted. Yeah, but yesterday, Luke thought he felt shaking. It could have been an earthquake, right, Luke? Luke nodded. Yeah, and the animals were acting weird. It's possible, their father said. But look, as I said, I think we have other much bigger problems to be concerned about right now. Make sure you pack plenty of water for the hike this afternoon and put on lots of sunscreen. Hard to say how long we'll be out there or what's going to happen next. Luke suddenly stood up and pointed to the desk in the cabin. Hey, what about the phone? Maybe we can call someone for help. The phones in the cabins were mainly for calling guest services and other cabins aboard, but they could also make international calls. Dr. Schuyler picked up the phone and put the receiver to his ear. Nope, not working. People will have to notice, as he said, and then they'll start complaining. Yes, and I'm sure whoever these people are, they'll have some excuse. As head to your room and get ready for the hike. Remember, let's not say or do anything to bring undue attention to ourselves or the fact that we know what's going on. She nodded, but Ezzy wasn't sure how easy that was going to be. Now she had to not freak out at all the way too close animals and pretend that gun-toting goons hadn't taken over the ship. No problem. About an hour later, as they headed to the stern to disembark for the hike, an announcement came over the shipwide intercom. It was Jorge. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Don't, uh, don't forget to pack water and wear sun protection for this afternoon's hike. His voice sounded a little shaky. 
I'd also um, I'd like to inform you that um, some people from the Galapagos National Park will be joining us to collect samples for scientific studies. As he thought she heard whispering in the background before Hori added, um, please um, stay out of their way and enjoy your hike. She and Luke looked to their father questioningly. He shrugged and shook his head. They hung back as people started loading into a Zodiac with Jorge. He and Giovanna were quieter than usual and glanced about nervously. Then seemingly out of nowhere, Aiden appeared in front of Ezzy. Hey, you coming on the hike? Uh-huh. Cool, maybe you can help me film again. Whatever, she said distractedly. Is something wrong? You don't look so good. Her father stepped forward and put his hand on Ezzy's shoulder. We're fine, kids might have eaten something, you know, bad at lunch. Stomachs are a little upset, but I, I'm trying to get them to try some new things. Luke and Ezzy rubbed their stomachs as if they weren't feeling well. Well, that sucks, Ed Aiden said, looking across the deck to where his parents and sister stood. My mom brought a whole bunch of stuff for seasickness, upset stomach, altitude sickness, you name it, we've got it if you need it. No thanks, Ezzy said, my dad's a doctor, we're okay. Oh look, they're loading the second boat, let's go. Cool, Aiden said, we'll be in the same zodiac as you guys. I'll be sure to watch out for snakes. Gee, as he said, you're just so funny. Oh, Luke grabbed Ezzy's hand and pulled her where they got their life jackets before heading onto the stern platform. Stringy hair, mustache guy was helping people into the Zodiac. Ezzy avoided eye contact and nearly leapt into the boat. Giovanna was already in the Zodiac. Her face was drawn and she seemed anxious, fidgeting about in the small space in front of the driver. Okay, everyone sit down and slide back, cheek to cheek. Soon they were speeding away from the ship. Ezzy turned back to watch as the crew loaded a couple of cages onto the other Zodiac, which had already dropped off one group of passengers. She tapped her father's arm and nodded toward the stern of the Darwin Voyager. The others in the Zodiac noticed and turned to watch. Grandpa Jones looked at Giovanna. Is that the group from the National Park? Looks like it, Giovanna replied sullenly. What sort of study are they doing? Asked the elderly man, smoothing back his short, bright white hair. I'm not sure, answered Giovanna, before signaling the Zodiac driver to speed up and head to the island. As he stared at the cages and the men dressed like naturalists, slowly it dawned on her and she knew. She knew what the men were after. They weren't drug smugglers or illegal fishermen. They were poachers. They were going to steal animals. She read a story on the internet about how people tried to smuggle the unique wildlife out of the Galapagos and then sell them for big bucks in the exotic animal tra trade. One guy was arrested at the airport when his duffel bag began wiggling. When she'd read the article, as he couldn't believe people could be that stupid, the man had put live iguanas in his luggage. She figured the hijackers must be planning on using their ship to smuggle animals out of the Galapagos. As he noticed Luke also staring at the cages and the men loading the other boat. He had probably figured it out too. She hoped he could hold it together. He was just a kid after all, and a totally animal obsessed kid's beside. About halfway to the landing site on Fernandina, as he glanced back at the ship, lamenting over her too, not good, scary, all around terrible options, gun-toting bad guys on the ship, or a wild creature laden trail. The boat slowed and they neared a small landing pier. Giovanna stood up and addressed the group. Uh, this is the only landing site on Fernandina. The rest of the island is off limits except for research. As you know, it's the youngest island in the Galapagos. Notice the island's shape, much like an upside down soup bowl. It is characteristic of the volcanoes here. As he definitely hadn't been thinking about the shape of the island, not even close. But now that Giovanna mentioned it, Fernandina did resemble a colossal green and black striped upside down soup bowl with a wide rim, rim of black volcanic rocks and short green-leaved mangrove trees. How high is it? asked Aiden's father. About 4,800 feet. Okay, we're coming to the landing pier. Watch where it's wet as it can be quite slippery. And please keep an eye out while walking. These are the most productive waters in the Galapagos. Here, deep nutrient-rich water wells up to the surface and creates a very rich marine food web. Because of that, there's lots of food for the animals here especially algae from marine iguanas. We find the largest marine iguanas in the area, and this particular spot has the densest population in the islands. Oh, great, as he thought. Sea turtle, exclaimed Luke, pointing into the clear, shallow water beside the boat. Look, 
There's a marine iguana swimming, Aiden added, pointing to a dark iguana with its limbs plastered against its body and its head sticking up out of the water. The iguana's tail swished back and forth, pushing it forward. As he looked around, marine iguanas were everywhere, in the water, climbing out of the water, and lying on the rocks. The place was teeming with the things. Oh, she took a deep breath to calm herself. Then a giant black bird swooped past her head, causing her duck so fast, she nearly fell out of the boat. Frigate bird, Luke told her. They like to steal other birds' food. Giovanna gave Luke the thumbs up as they approached a small pier, as he noticed sea lions playing in a rocky pool and a giant gray bird stalking fish nearby. Bright red crabs scuttled over the dark rocks. She looked overhead to see if any, if any hawks were around. Once beside the small concrete walkway, they climbed out of the boat and took off their life jackets. Looking down the trail, as he could see a large open flat area surrounded by a forest of mangroves. It was covered with marine iguanas, not just one or two. Literally, it was a carpet of hideous black booger sneezing iguanas. As he had grown accustomed to dealing with one or even a few iguanas, but this was on a whole other level. Her father came over and gave his daughter a firm pat on the back, whispering, they're harmless as you can do this, no problem. Luke put his pudgy hand in Essie's and led her forward. Be brave, as he thought. Act like you don't want to run away screaming. She turned back toward the Zodiac, but the small boat had already backed away from the landing site so that the next one could pull up. Luke yanked on her hand, pulling her toward the iguana carpet. Aiden was nearby filming them. Terrific, as he thought. He's going to capture my freak out on camera. Ahead of her, Grandma and Grandpa Jones used their walking sticks to slowly navigate around the mass of iguanas. Suddenly, a loud crack rang out. Before anyone could reach her, Grandma Jones pitched forward. Her walking stick had split in two, and she'd done a nosedive right onto the iguana carpet. Eyes wide as he guessed, oh, the horror. But then, the most surprising thing happened. Grandma Jones laughed. No blood curdling scream or shout for help. She went into cardiac arrest as, as he expected. The woman was leaning on one arm and a knee chuckling. She looked up at the others. Never thought I'd say this, but thank you, iguanas. They broke my fall. Oh, honey pie, let me help you, Grandpa Jones said as he helped his wife to her feet. Are you all right, my darling? Fine, sugar, just a little fall. For their part, the iguanas hardly seemed to notice anything had happened. They shuffled silently out of the way sneezed a bit more, and then simply found another spot to lounge on, one on top of another. Giovanna, Dr. Schuyler, and Aiden's father all rushed to the older woman's side, but Grandma Jones just calmly brushed the dirt off her hands and knees. I hope I didn't hurt the little dickens. They're actually quite soft. Ezzie was in shock. Any cuts or pains, Dr. Schuyler asked? No, really, I'm good. I'm a little tougher than I look, she said, winking at the man. My walking stick now, that's another story. She looked at the two halves of the aluminum pole. Oh dear, it's definitely done for. Giovanna took the two pieces of the broken walking stick and shoved them into her backpack. Grandpa Jones tried to give his wife his walking stick, but she waved it away. She might be one old and, little, and a little kooky, as he thought, but that lady is definitely one tough cookie. After that, Giovanna headed down the trail. As he expected Luke to pull her along, but he hadn't moved. Her brother stood staring at the group of men behind them with a look she'd never seen on him. Pure hatred. Five men had come in the following zodiac. They wore khaki outfits like naturalists pretending to be with the Galapagos National Park. Slung across each of their backs was a strange looking gun. Come on, as he said to Luke, there's nothing we can do right now. Remember, we're pretending everything's okay. They're going to hurt the animals, Luke hissed. He let go of her hand squatted down and started chasing the iguanas out of sight. Hey, you there, what are you doing? Shouted one of the men. Stop that. Get going with the rest of the group. From up ahead, Giovanna yelled back, come on guys. Dr. Sky was, Dr. Sky was ahead of them and didn't see when Luke turned and stuck his tongue out at the men behind them. As he stifled a laugh and pulled him forward as they jogged to catch up with the group. Giovanna stared at the two of them. She told the others to go ahead following the sticks marking the trail and hung back for a moment. Be careful, she whispered. Well, 
that's it for today. Boy, so now they're on the island. They're on Fernandina with the bad guys hiking. And now they know they're poachers. So they'll have to come. You'll have to listen, see what happens next. We're going to try and go live Friday at 2 p.m., same place, same time as usual. If you can't go live or you can't see us live, don't forget, you can always see the recorded version. Go to the, the Facebook page for the Florida Cram and click on videos. And also, you can, if you didn't get to ask questions today, you can still ask me to send them to me at Twitter at E.L. Prager. And we had a couple questions from last time. Lauren asked if illegal fishing is still a problem in the Galapagos. And Lauren, I'm, I'm sorry to say it still is. In particular, shark finning. It's illegal to catch sharks and fin them in, in the Galapagos Islands, but they've caught boats with hundreds of sharks killed for just their fins. So that's something they're really trying to prevent. Jen asked, have I ever seen a volcano erupting in the Galapagos? Well, Jen, I have been dying to see a volcano erupting in the Galapagos because we can safely view them from the ships. I've seen one from kind of far away, but unfortunately I've never gotten up close to one. Typically what happens is when I'm there, no eruption, and as soon as I leave, the naturalists I work with send me the most amazing pictures ever, and they say, Ellen, guess what's happening? One of these days. So stay tuned, come on back. We got lots of cool animals. We don't know about this earthquake and volcano thing. So see you next time. Bye.